Welcome everyone. My name is David. I'm here at Moffitt Library with uh, John Fontana, our uh, NASA ambassador, here to do a program on the Big Bang Theory and some uh, different interpretations or theories of uh, the origin of the universe and thoughts on the ultimate fate of the universe. So it's going to be uh, a rather big program today. Uh, John, thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. It's my pleasure. So um, everyone okay tonight? Everyone doing well? Um, tonight, we're gonna to take a journey. The journey is gonna be back to the beginning of what we thought was time. And we may be able to go back to before the beginning of time. So you'll see what I mean as we go through this presentation. Um, so the, the presentation is about, did the, did the Big Bang really happen? And how did we get everything from nothing? As it's constantly said, um, you can't get something for nothing. Well, it appears that we got the universe for nothing. <laughs> And notice I said appears. <laughs> so just to start off with a disclaimer, all the opinions and commentary are mine. And just this nice picture here is from uh, NASA's Sloan Digital Sky Survey. We have a nice corona mass ejection coming off the sun, hopefully not coming towards Earth. Um, OK, so to start with, we have six puzzling questions in cosmology concerning the Big Bang. What bang? Why did it bang? What was there before the bang? How did we get this seemingly infinite place from nothing or get something from nothing? Where did everything that was contained in the Big Bang come from? And what's going to happen to us in the future? What's going to happen to this universe of ours? So going back uh, about 24, 2500 years, uh, this is what people thought the universe was, was. So we have Aristotle and Ptolemy. They thought that the Earth was the center of everything. So this is a geocentric model of the universe, as it appeared to everyone back then. So we have the Earth, the Moon, then the planets, Mercury, Venus, the Sun came after Venus, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the rest of the stars. Don't worry about the sphere of the prime mover because that has to do with philosophy from Aristotle and that's not in the purview of, of this presentation. But uh, we were the center of the universe according to everyone back then. And 100 years ago, just a mere 100 years, scientists thought that the Milky Way was the entire universe. They looked up at the night sky, saw all those stars, they trained their telescopes on, um, on space and said, the Milky Way was it, there's nothing else. And as we know, that is not true. So what is the universe? Well, it's everything. That's the definition of a universe. It's all of space, all of matter and energy that's within that space. It even includes time. Prior to Einstein, people thought that there were three dimensions, three spatial dimensions. Einstein comes along and says, no, there's a fourth dimension. And that is temporal, meaning time. So now we have space time and space time is a fabric it's not a fabric as fabrics that we're familiar with, but there is a fabric to the universe. And that's what gravity is about, really. What's that fabric made of? We don't know. <laughs> we have no clue. But much of what we see in the universe is in the form of individual atoms of hydrogen. Hydrogen being the simplest element and the mysterious dark matter that we'll get into in a little while. So with space time, there is no such thing as empty space. If you grab the telescope, pointed it at the sky, um, you'd see what appeared to be empty space, but there is something 
everywhere in space. There is no absence of gravity. There's microgravity where gravity is not as strong. And in, um, there's also um, particles that come into existence and then pop out. It's, it's governed by uh, mechanics and it's, uh, they are particles that just appear and within a split second, they disappear. So just as a point of reference, out of space, how far do you have above do you have to go to get to space? 62 miles above the Earth's surface. So once you hit that threshold, um, you are officially in space. Oh, by the way, when I mentioned mechanics, it's really what's known as quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the realm of the subatomic particles. And that's a very strange realm. So perhaps one day, David and I will do a presentation on that. Because if you want to talk about weird, it's um, quantum mechanics. All of the matter in the universe came into existence about 13.8 billion years ago. And in a little while, I'll get into how we figured out 13.8 billion years. Um, but it is based on the oldest stars we found and the rate at which the universe is expanding. The universe is actually inflating. Um, and when I get into the big stretch, I'll show you what the inflation looks like with the help of this little balloon. At the time of what they call the Big Bang, all matter was compacted in a single, infinitesimally small point with infinite density, gravity, and very intense heat. It was very hot. Structures could not form because it was so hot. The problem with um, everything being infinitesimally small and infinitesimally dense is that when you have infinity in, phys in physics, that's not allowed. We can't figure things out. The mathematics don't go there. So that is why we've had so much trouble figuring out, well, that's one reason why we've had so much trouble figuring out what happened at the Big Bang. But this small um, singularity was what we got everything from. It was, we had a point that was smaller than an atom. Space and time did not exist. And that little point, the subatomic point was called a singularity. So why is it called a singularity? It's a single point and we had nothing else to call it because we don't know what was there before. Everything was in the same spot. The entire universe was one spot. Time had not begun. So if you wanna ask, where did the Big Bang occurred? It occurred all over the universe because the universe came out of the singularity. So it occurred here in Orange County, um, over in Europe, on Mars, th uh, 13 million light years from Earth, 13 billion light years from Earth. Everything since it came out of that singularity is where the Big Bang happened. John, before you go on to the next slide, we just got a question from Benjamin. Um, yes. Are there other singularities and could another universe outside of our own exist? I know you're going to cover that a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, that's just a, a great question, I thought. It is. It's a great question, and we will get into that. And yes, many scientists believe that we're not the only universe. First, to, well, to give you a preview, first, they believe we weren't the first universe. Secondly, they believe that there are other universes out there. The interesting, one interesting theory is that there could be a universe right next to, it, to us. So there could be a universe right next to each one of us. So look around, see what's going on. <laughs> but great question, Benjamin. That's what's been puzzling physicists for quite some time. 
So the singularity expanded. It expanded like a balloon. So here comes my balloon. <laughs> That's how the universe came into existence. <laughs> it was not a big bang. <laughs> it was the big stretch. Or as a well-known physicist by the name of um, Guth, Alan Guth, G-U-T-H, um, I forget which uh, university he's with out in California, but he said there was no such thing as the Big Bang. And when you think about it, there really couldn't be a bang. When we talk about the Big Bang, when you look at TV shows, it's an explosion. But there was no explosion because there was no space. Without space, we didn't have oxygen and we didn't have a medium for sound to go through. So, um, there was no sound, even if it was an explosion, but it wasn't. It was the balloon inflating. And if I had an ant inside this balloon, um, first of all, I wouldn't be blowing it up. But secondly, um, this balloon would be the ant's entire universe. And that's what we're in. And Benjamin, this gets to your point as well. We could have bubbles out there, just like this balloon could be a bubble. And the little ant on the inside of this bubble has one universe. And if I blew, blew up another balloon with another ant, um, that would be another universe for that other ant. And that's what could be going on out there. We could have universes that are essentially bubbles. And the way the bubbles happen is that the universe is expanding, but it's not expanding evenly. Excuse me. So that one spot in the universe could stop expanding while another keeps going. The one that keeps going is going to become another uh, bubble. And that's another universe. So how do we figure out that the universe was 13.8 billion years old? Well, Again, going back to our little balloon, um, if I can get it not to make an obnoxious noise, let's count how long it takes to deflate. Six seconds, somewhere around there. So the, the, balloon, the inflated balloon was six seconds old. Um, when scientists were looking at the were looking at inflation, they realized that if you backed time up, if you backed up the universe and deflated it, you'd come out to 13.8 billion years ago. And there, the person who's responsible for that is a Jesuit priest by the name of Father George Lamatra, which we'll get into in a minute. The universe is continuing to expand continuing to expand. So that means that the universe was more compact last Saturday than it was today, and it would be less compact tomorrow than it is today. And it's going to keep going on and on. The space, interestingly, is expanding faster than the speed of light. Speed of light, according to Einstein, is a com cosmic speed limit. Nothing can go through space faster than 186,000 miles per second. Um, and that equates to 6 trillion miles per year. That's going through space. Space, however, makes it its own rules. So it, the rule that it made is, I'm going faster than the speed of light. And that's why galaxies that are way, way out there, we will never see them because they're expanding faster than our ability to get to them, which is rather sad. I'd like to know what's out there. Um, so if we could go back far enough to when the balloon was deflated, we would see that things were so close together and hot that not even atoms could form. And as I mentioned, the Big Bang wasn't a bang. There just wasn't any medium for a bang to occur. Plus, 
a bang uh, insinuates that there was a central point of ignition and there was no central point of ignition. Think about a firecracker since we just passed July 4th. Firecracker explodes, you know where the firecracker exploded, but little debris from the firecracker um, goes all over the place. It's not smooth. Whereas that's smooth. This is what happened to the universe. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the universe um, was a smooth expansion. It wasn't willy nilly where things just exploded all around. And I'll tell you how the term Big Bang came into existence. It's actually a bit funny. Um, no central point, no ignition point is inferred by the Big Bang. And the Big Bang was an insulting term uh, coined by, in 1949, by Fred Hoyle, who was a British astronomer. And he rejected the theory of inflation. He said, he and Einstein actually said um, that the universe was in a steady state. It wasn't changing, it wasn't growing, shrinking, or whatever. So Hoyle, when he heard about the Big Bang theory, and the reason why we keep saying Big Bang is just because the label stuck. Um, he uh, rejected that theory and in, he thought it was comical and said, oh, it was a big bang. Even Einstein was wrong. And I'll show you how wrong Einstein was. John, we have yeah. a question in the chat asking uh, why scientists think that the universe uh, uh, expanded at a steady rate. Uh, so we calculate that the age is 13.8 billion years based on um, running the expansion in reverse, but is there a reason why we, uh, we know or assume that um, it was a steady state? Could the universe have been expanding slower or faster in the past? Interesting question. <laughs> um, yes, we do know that the universe was expanding slower in the past. Uh, when we say steady, steady state, it means it wasn't changing at all. It wasn't inflating. It was doing nothing, it was just there. So if I looked up at a star today and 20 years from now, I wanted to find that same star, it would be in the same spot. But that's not what happens. It would be in a different spot. And some guy by the name of Hubble <laughs> um, found that galaxies were moving. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? So Benjamin asked, could the universe be older or younger than 13.8 billion years if the universe expanded at different rates throughout time because it is known that the universe expands more in certain areas? Uh, so if scientists can calculate that 13.8 uh, billion years based on uh, or their knowledge that it was expanding faster or slower in the past, uh, so that would account for why they think they arrived at the 13.8 number. Right. And Edwin Hubble actually came up with the Hubble constant, which is his calculation as to how fast the universe was expanding. So he came up with um, 71 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And I've got this in another slide. We've actually calculated it to be 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But what we found is that the universe in recent times has sped up its expansion. So it expanded more slowly in the past and now it has sped up. And we believe it has spread up thanks to something called dark energy. And it's continuing to speed up. So the more it speeds up, the closer we get to the end of the universe. <laughs> but we have a little bit of time. <laughs> Uh, this is an illustration from NASA as to how the Big Bang or big inflation or big stretch really worked. Just imagine what's coming at you is a balloon. This is a balloon being inflated with all the stars, galaxies coming at you.
this is inflation in the universe. So where and when did the big bang take place? As I mentioned, everything came from the singularity. So it took place everywhere and at no time because there was no time before the big bang or we believe there was no time before the big bang. That had been the prevailing theory and we'll see alternatives to that in just a few minutes. There is a cosmic tug of war going on between dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter, we don't know what dark matter is made of and we can't even see it. That's why we call it dark matter. But we know it's out there and we know it's responsible for the galaxies forming into their individual shapes. Um, scientists have tried to re recreate the universe without dark matter and everything falls apart. So dark matter is very important for keeping everything together. Since it's matter and matter has gravity, dark matter has a great deal of gravity. So that's in, a, in essence pulling the universe together. Dark energy on the other hand is something that we're not quite sure of either. But dark energy, <clears throat> excuse me, Dark energy is what's pulling the universe apart. It's responsible for the expansion. We don't know what comprises it, but it seems to be even more energetic because the universe, as I mentioned, is expanding at an even faster rate. When you look up into the sky and you consider everything um, that we see including the earth we're standing on, ourselves, and everything. That is a minute part of what, the what makes up the universe. All of the matter represents only 0.4% of what's out there. 3.6% is intergalactic gas. That dark matter is 22%. Dark energy, on the other hand, is 74%. So since it's so large, that could be the reason that everything is expanding at an expanding rate or at an increasing rate. So how does the universe look? Well, on a large scale, it's the same everywhere. So if you could um, <clears throat> go out 300 million light years, everything would look exactly the same to you because there's no special place in the universe despite what some people think, they're not the center of the universe. And the laws of physics are the same every, everywhere, except if there are other universes out there, there could be different laws. And if there are bubble universes, if you, went, if you were able to go from one bubble to the other, there would be different laws. But if we were able to go into these different universes and the laws of physics are different, we would be instantly killed. So according to Sir Isaac Newton, he said the universe is static. Again, it's not moving. It's made of an infinite number of stars that are scattered throughout infinite space. And the universe is infinitely old and it's going to go on forever and ever without major changes. Then along comes Albert Einstein. Even Albert Einstein plugged fudge factors into his formulas. I can remember doing that in math mathematics in school. But he came up with, when he came up with his theory of general relativity, he found that the universe was expanding and he didn't believe it. He said, no, this is not possible. Um, so he inserted a fudge factor, which he called his cosmological constant. And that made everything steady. It wasn't expanding and it wasn't contracting. 
So even Einstein played around with math. In 1927, along comes Father George Lamatra, and he proposed that the universe is expanding. He was an amateur astronomer, and he was dismissed because he was an amateur astronomer who went against the grain and said the universe is expanding. All the great scientists back then were saying, no, the universe is steady. And Lamatra said, no, it's expanding. So how did that get solved? Well, in 1929, um, Edwin Hubble, and there he is, confirmed Father Lamatra's prediction of an expanding universe. He took his tel telescope, trained it on a galaxy, and after a period of time, came back to the telescope looking for that galaxy, and it had moved. So he calculated that the universe was expanding. And we have Hubble's law from which we calculated time in the past when the universe was that single point. Again, if we could uh, make an analogy with the balloon, um, it expands. And if we could look back as we did um, with the balloon, we could see that the universe was a, a point, an infinitely small point, but a point nonetheless. And he calculated that the universe was about 13.8 billion years old. And there's his telescope. That was his reward. We need the telescope after him. <laughs> Unfortunately, the telescope is having software problems. So we don't know what's going to happen to it. His, the law named after him is, says that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. So if I'm looking at a galaxy that's 10 million light years away from us, and then I want to look at a galaxy that's 20 million light years away, what I will find is that the galaxy that's 20 million light years, since that's double 10 million, is moving twice as fast from us as, um, as that other galaxy. So the further away you are, the faster you are moving but the galaxies are staying in place. So if I made a mark on this balloon or several marks on this balloon and inflated it, those marks are going to stay in the same spot. What's expanding is the balloon. And that's exactly what's happening to the universe. So galaxies are in the exact same place. It's, the, it's space that's changing. So how do we figure out how far everything is? Well, one way is by luminosity, how bright a body is. The analogy there is, if you were standing on the side of a road, watching cars coming at you, the cars that are further away, their lights will be dimmer than the cars that are, that are close to you. So the same thing applies out in, in the cosmos. Whatever's out there, stars or planets, the dimmer they are, the further away they are, and the brighter they are, the closer they are to, it, to us. Another way is by variable stars that are known as Cepheids, they pulsate. And it, the pulsations are directly related to its brightness. And these are very bright stars so that very distant ones can be observed and measured. Then we also have red giant stars and these are great mile markers. Just like a mile marker on a highway, we use this rate, these red giants to help us determine distances. So how big is the universe? Now remember I said, or, or as we all know, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So how did the universe um, how did the di diameter of the universe get to be 92 billion light years because of, because of expansion? So the universe is 13.8 billion years old, but the diameter, because of inflation, has grown to 92 billion light years. And it's continuing to grow. So for example, 
we, if we were here, we are never going to get to here because we can't go faster than the speed of light. I had an interesting question during one of my presentations. Why is the night sky dark? And the answer is not because we're facing away from the sun at night. The answer is it's with all the stars in the universe, we should be blinded by light at night. It, the night sky should be lit up, but light has been traveling to us, to us from the far reaches of the universe. And since the speed of light is limited to 6 trillion miles per year, and the universe has been expanding faster than that, than that, the light from distant stars can never reach us. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are places in the universe that are just beyond our reach. And there may be some sort of life form out there that's wondering the same thing. What's out there? And we will never meet each other. Kind of a sad thought. 10 to the minus 43rd power. That's um, 41 zeros and then a 4-3. So point 41 zeros and a 4-3. That is amazingly small. And the reason why I mentioned this is because that's the furthest back we can go in time. Um, that's what we can't go any further back than that 10 to the minus 43rd power. At that time, speaking of heat, the universe, um, the temperature was 10 to the 32nd power Kelvin, which is extremely hot. At 10, to the minus 35, 35th, however you say that, second, um, that's when the universe started expanding. So even though we can define it, we really don't understand it. So inflation began um, at that 10 to the minus 30 second, 30, yeah, 30 second power seconds. The first trillionth of a second, the universe was heated to over a trillion degrees. It was a trillion, 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 trillion degrees. That's a bit hot. It was even hotter than today. <laughs> so this will give you some perspective as to how the what the temperature was and how we've cooled off and what happens as we cooled off. So at that earliest time that we could go back to, the universe was at 10 to the 32nd power in terms of heat. Then it started cooling as we got further along in time. So as we got to one second, we went from 10 to the 32nd power to 10 to the 10th power. Three, only three minutes later, it was 10 to the 9th. 300,000 years later, it was down to 6,000 degrees. 380,000 years is the furthest back we could see. And that's something we are, when we hit that time frame, we find what's known as a cosmic microwave background radiation, which is an interesting story that I'll get to. So as we kept keep going out, we 1,000 million years, we're down to a cool 18 degrees and 15,000 million years. Basically today, we have an even three degrees Kelvin or it's actually 2.725, which creates a problem. Um, it creates an isotropy problem, meaning that the universe, no matter where you are, its temperature would be 2.725 degrees. So how could that be? How could one spot in the universe um, that's billions of light years away from another be almost exactly the same temperature? Well, in quantum mechanics, there's something called quantum entanglement. 
So that when everything was in a singularity, um, everything was together. And when it came out and when the bang banged, um, everything kept the same parameters. And as things cooled off here, you could see atoms, galaxies, planets, and stars forming. This is the oldest galaxy we found, we found so far, 13.4 billion years old. This is the interesting story about the Big Bang. These are two scientists who were with Bell Labs, Bell Labs being the research arm of um, what was, well, AT&T, which is still in existence, but um, they were the research arm of AT&T. These two guys were located in Homedale, New Jersey. They were looking for ways to bring telephone service to rural communities. This was back in the, I think, 1950s. So they built this big horn, hoping to figure out how to bring that telephone service to people that don't have it. Interesting thing happened. They kept hearing a hum. They had no idea what it was. So they called up the local army base and asked if the army was doing anything. The army said no. They called up the local Air Force base, asked them the same question to which the same answer came. No, we're not doing anything. And finally, they decided to clean out the horn of pigeon poop, thinking maybe the pigeon poop was causing the hum. So they cleaned it out and the hum still existed. They finally went to somebody at Princeton University who said, hey guys, this is a leftover from the Big Bang. So they discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is an act, which actually is an echo of the Big Bang. And this is what it looks like. This is our universe, universe's baby picture. This is the equivalent of us at seven seconds old. It was produced 380,000 years after that Big Bang. It's the oldest light in the universe. We can't go further back than that because it was so hot in the universe that um, electrons could not hook up with protons and everything was just flying around. We found no way to do that. Um, we got this picture from a couple of different probes, one called WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, and the Cosmic Background Explorer otherwise known as Kobe. The blue spots are the hotter, te hotter temperatures, meaning that areas are less dense. The red spots are the colder ones. They're the denser areas. And the reason why they're denser is because of gravitational potential well, uh, wells. These are regions where photons are pulled into by gravity. So that's why they're so dense, because they're just filled with photons. Photons are really the packets of light. So what we, when we look up at the sun, we're seeing photons coming off of it. And so, as I mentioned, we had the isotropy problem of everything being 2.725 Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's absolute zero. And just to give you an idea of what 2.725 would be, one degree Kelvin is 457.87 degrees or minus 457.87 degrees. This is a TV screen from back in the day. Before we had cable, we had TV sets with rabbit ears, little antennas going up. And if you didn't have that, you were plugged into, if you lived in an apartment, uh, you were plugged into an antenna that was on the roof. Well, at times the antennas and the rabbit ears would 
uh, not work properly. Something moved them and you'd have to adjust it. The way you knew something moved it was because you got a snowy screen. 1% of this snow is a leftover of the Big Bang. So this is a signature of the Big Bang right on our TV sets. Some people have a problem with the Big Bang Theory. They said it's too complex, it became too complex too early. There are too many large structures to be created in only 10 to 20 billion years. We know the rate of expansion, we can get a rough estimate on how long it would take for them to form. And the estimate that these people, these scientists said, it would take about 100 billion years for everything that we have today to form. Um, and that's just one theory, but the prevailing theory and one that's been pretty much proven is the Big Bang occurred 13.8 billion years ago. And that's where we got everything. The universe has a shape. So what shape are we in? Well, there are three different possibilities. Um, and it's based on energy density. First possibility is a saddle shape, which is open, it, open and it's also infinite. So if we were to go out, we would never come back to our starting point. The next possibility is flat, and that's also infinite. Again, we would go out and never return to our starting point. The third possibility is it's closed, and it would look like a sphere, just like the Earth. So if we started here, for example, and went around, we would come back to our starting point. And it's almost like those old video games um, the Atari video games where if you moved the cursor or whatever it was back then to one side of the screen, it would come around to the other side of the screen. That's a closed universe. So which is it? Well, as I mentioned with a flat universe, you're traveling in a straight line, never returning to the starting point. According to our latest observations, we live in a flat universe. A closed universe is curved up like that surface of a ball and an open universe is curved away from itself and you'd never come back um, to the starting point. So observations have said that we are flat. So how do we know it's flat? Well, when you zoom out to 300 million light years, the, as the universe looks the same. It had to be flat to start off out with because everything that inflated from the singularity um, was flat and inflation was enormous at the Big Bang. So when I start blowing up my little balloon, um, it starts off pretty quickly. Me uh, the measurements of the amount of dark energy is that it will keep on expanding and that expansion will accelerate. So whatever's gonna to happen to the universe will happen faster than we originally thought. Probes confirmed the universe is flat. We have the European Space Agency's Planck Space Telescope. It didn't detect any distortion to the flatness. And that COBE Explorer that I mentioned before also confirmed that the universe is flat. So where are we going with this universe of ours? Well, there are three possibilities. One is the big freeze. The other is the big crunch. And the other is an ominous sounding big rip. The big freeze is the most accepted theory for how the universe will, en will end. Dark energy will cause the universe to expand forever universe will become very cold because stars have a finite lifetime. Could be very long, could be trillions of years, but eventually the universe will have no stars in it. It will be a cold, dark place as all the stars burn out. 
That's supposed to take place in 100 trillion years. Then we have the big crunch. Um, it, that means that expansion will stop. Gravity or dark matter will bring everything back together and the universe will contract. And after billions of years of contracting, the universe will crunch back into that singularity and it could possibly cause another big bang. The timeline on that is a mere 100 billion years. Then we have the big rip. That's where the universe expands so fast that everything just rips apart. The fabric of space-time is ripped apart. Atoms are ripped apart. If we were around in 22 billion years from now, our atom, the atoms in our bodies would be ripped apart as well. What was there before? This is what we can't figure out. We have ideas, but we don't know. We got nothing. We do have theories. The first one is the universe is an infinite stretch of an ultra hot dense material existing in an unchanging state, the singularity. And then the Big Bang occurred and pop, we have the universe. Before our universe, there was another one identical to ours, except that time ran opposite to ours. Imagine time going backwards. The way we know that, that time is moving forward is because of something called entropy. Do I have? Entropy is a measure of order disorder. So according to the laws of thermodynamics, entropy is constantly increasing. High entropy means low order. Low entropy means high order. So um, the universe is always moving towards low order. Entropy is always increasing and that's one of the laws of thermal dynamics. So the way we know that time is marching forward is that entropy is increasing. An example would be, if I had an egg here on the edge of my desk and the egg rolled off and smashed on the floor, I'd have a big mess. Well, none of us have ever seen an egg jump back onto a table or a desk and reform as an egg. That's entropy. We will never go back to the past. The only time travel um, that we could do to the past is by looking up at the night sky. Because light, since it has a finite speed of 6 trillion miles per year, when you look at a star, you're seeing that star as it was um, based on its distance. So if you're looking at a star that's six light years away, the light that's coming from that star is six years old. We're not seeing that star as we're seeing it today. In fact, our sun, it takes eight, I think it's eight and a half minutes for the light to get from the sun over to earth. So the light that we see is actually eight and a half minutes old. The third theory is that there was a parent universe from which ours broke off. And then according to Mr. Stephen Hawking, the Big Bang is the only moment that matters. Before the Big Bang, we can't measure anything and everything was undefined. He called this a no boundary proposal. Time and space are infinite. There are no boundaries or starting or ending points. The same way that the planet is, Earth is finite, and has no edge. So he continuing with what he said, there was no beginning and there'll be no end. He equated it to asking what light lies south of the South Pole. But one of the possibilities out there is called cyclic cosmology. The universe goes through infinite cycles where a big bang is the birth of a new universe. 
Um, Roger Penrose, who is a British physicist, said that the radiation coming out of black holes is a remnant of a previous universe. And the matter we see in the universe is confined to, oh, brain theory. The matter in the universe is confined to a local brain, a brain being a flat universe, which I'll get, it, which I have an illustration of. A big bang, a big crunch, big bang occurs when two such brains collide and a singularity that's a uh, subatomic uh, point occurs only in the sense that the dimension that se separates two brains disappears during the collision. So here's what brain theory looks like. We're here, we're on one brain and then there's another brain out there. So everything we have is here. The brains start moving closer together. Notice how they're not exactly flat, but then they flatten out after a trillion years. They're empty, flat, and parallel, <clears throat> but there's an interbrain force that draws them together and becomes wrinkled again. The brains start coming closer together and they collide creating non-uniform hot plasma, and then they rebound. And that rebound is a big bang. But a microsecond after the big bang, the brains reach maximum se separation. And then we start the entire cycle all over, over again. Another theory is the big bounce, bounce theory. The universe was born multiple times in endless cycles of contraction and expansion. So this means that the universe is ageless and it self renews. And this is what it would look like. We have a universe here, contracts down to this little point. There's a big bang, it expands, another big bang and another expansion. And it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, but we, we are not, we don't have any explanation for what was there before. If you wanted my opinion, I feel that there had to be something there before. And even if you believe in the big, the big bounce theory, or even in the brain theory, there had to be a starting point. What was that starting point? We may never find out. So Benjamin, let's go to parallel universes. Um, there are five theories. We have infinite universes. The universe is flat, goes on forever. So there may, may be many universes out there, including those bubble universes that I mentioned before. But it's possible that the universes can start repeating themselves. That's because atoms and particles can be put together in so many, in only so many different permutations. Um, so there are only so many differences that can occur based upon the fact that they may, the universe may be infinite. There's a physicist by the name of Brian Green, who's with Columbia University, who equated this to your clothes closet. Let's say you have five shirts um, and five pairs of slacks, and you want to wear a different outfit every day. Well, that gives you only 25 different outfits. On the 26th day, you have to go back to the first outfit. And he said, it's exactly how the universe would work if we do, in fact, live in an infinite universe. There's only so many different ways that you can get different things. So think about what that means. That means you and I are out there somewhere. Cop copies of us are out there and they're doing exactly what we're doing right now. Listening to this presentation. There's a scary thought. <laughs> and then we have the bubble universes that I mentioned before um 
some areas inflate, others stop. We could be sitting in a network of bubble universes of space and the other universes could have very different laws of physics. Um, and, and I mentioned if you were even able to jump from one bubble to another, you would be instantly destroyed. Daughter universes, this is the one that's inter that really interests me. For every outcome that could come from one of our decisions, there would be a range of universes, each one of which, which saw a different outcome. All possible outcomes come to be. So for example, everybody familiar with Babe Ruth being traded from the Boston Red Sox to the Yankees? Well, in one universe, Boston kept Babe Ruth, probably went on to win multiple World Series. But in another, they traded him to the Yankees and the Yankees went to, on to win multiple World Series. And in another, we all won the lottery. There's mathematical universes which says that um, Another avenue is exploring mathematical, well, mathematical universes, which explain that the structure of math may change depending on which universe you reside in. So all the laws of mathematics could be totally different than what we know. Parallel universes, as I mentioned, there, there could be parallel universes with copies of us. They could be standing right next to us. Um, cosmic and they're cosmic patches that are exactly the same as ours. And again, there could be someone exactly the same as us, as well as patches that differ by just one or more particles, particle positions, which could mean a big difference depending on what it is. And we've seen science fiction um, mention parallel universes, it's popular. We have it in the old Star Trek series, the Star Trek movies. We even have it, well, if there are parallel universes and multiple universes, we have multiple Earths, but we even have it in literature. Alice in Wonderland. Um, Lewis Carroll is not the author's real name. It's Charles Lutwidge Dodgson. He was a mathematician who wrote 11 books on math in addition to 12 works of literary fiction. Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass are his stories of parallel universes going down the rabbit hole. And the Cheshire Cat, in fact, is a reference to a physicist theory. The Wizard of Oz. One of my favorite musicals. Uh, oh, wait a minute. The Wizard of Oz is also a story of a parallel universe. The Land of Oz. So are we ever going to find out um, how we came into existence? How this universe came into existence? Well, it could be that the universe doesn't want to let us know. It could have, um, I apologize for the phone ringing. Um, it could, have a mind of its own and won't ever allow us. And that ends, ends the presentation. So thank you very much for attending. I enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, one thing that I want to point out before I stop this recording is that if anyone is interested in cosmology, there's a lot of concepts, there's a lot of different theories uh, proposed over uh, the course of history. Uh, feel free to check out, say, the um, Encyclopedia Britannica article on cosmology, which runs down all of the different theories and all of the uh, implications of the uh, different eras of the universe. Uh, and you can do that uh, for free with your library card through the Moffitt Library uh, website as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we will have uh, Q&A uh, now.